I was uh, nominated for an Eisner for humor. This was all before Axe Cop. And that was one reason I wanted to get a webcomic, because I made these comics that people that would read that read them loved them. Uh, Joey's got great reviews. Uh, Jonan Vasquez, who created Invader Zim and Johnny Comics Final Maniac, wrote an amazing review of these comics. Um, but I was just realizing that, like, the age where people walk into a comic shop looking for a black and white comic they've never heard of to buy and try out is like over. I grew up when that was like normal. Lots of people did that. But now they look on the internet, you know? So <clears throat> I started playing the idea of my next comic when I put it on the internet for free. Just put it out there and try that out. So that's what Bear again was going to be. Axe Cop was just supposed to be me testing out the functionality of posting comments on the internet. And then it became up. So just a rundown of the comics I had before, because I think this is, this is kind of the interesting thing that you'll hear that you won't see anywhere. I just stuff's nowhere else. So. These are these are comics I did before I got high school. When I was ten, 10 years old, I did a comic <coughs> called Drug Busters. But they were basically kind of a ripoff of the Ninja Turtles, but they fought these bad guys called the Marijuana Monsters, who would sneak up on children in alleyways and inject their necks with marijuana vials. <laughs> I didn't know what marijuana was. <laughs> they would like get them in a headlock. They had like their syringe of marijuana. And it could be rocking out to like the 80s headphones. And uh, they'd say like dude and stuff like that and they'd fight the like, monsters. I had stacks of these notebook paper comics I drew of me and my friends fighting elk and fighting ice cream cones and just fighting stuff. Uh, all of my first two self-published comics that I did in high school, I sold them to my classmates. Um, I basically had created a comic book in study hall. I created a, new, a few new pages every day to my friends who had study hall the next period after me. And uh, I ended up turning into an actual comic. I redrew it all. And it's just been an insane comic about school wrestlers and slugs. And stuff like that. After high school, um, I went to a comic con for my first time. Uh, and I knew I liked drawing comics, and I really wanted to write my own, but I just couldn't think of a good story. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's in that position where like, you have, feel like you have everything but like a good story to draw. So I went to Comic-Con in San Diego for my first time. I really wanted to break into comics finally, and uh, this is where I kind of realized that there's really two ways into the industry uh, in comics. You either become an amazing artist and get hired by Marvel or DC or something like that, and they can pay you the amount you know, that it takes to make a living. Or you do something like the Ninja Turtles guys did, and you make up some crazy awesome idea. You take a risk, you put it out there, and it gets bought and used. So at Comic-Con, I, I went to, just because I wanted to get better at drawing comics, because one thing I learned instantly when I went to San Diego Comic-Con um, is that I suck at drawing. Because I was from a small town, and I was, it's easy to be the best artist in your small town, but you go to Comic-Con where you're competing with every artist in the world, and suddenly you realize the, how bad you are. And uh, I wanted to just get better. So I went to a panel for writers, and um, I stood up during the Q&A and said, if anybody in here wants to work on a project with me, I just want to draw comics, I'm going to practice. So like, some writer, uh, I got, actually got bombarded. Like, writers just attacked me. And <laughs> this one guy worked in a game company. He had a good income. So he was like, whatever we make, I'll publish in the, in the comics. So it was kind of crazy because we, we did three issues of this. He, he wrote them, and I drew them. And <coughs> We did the two, the two and three of it together, and then he just like disappeared from the face of the earth and stopped answering emails, and I never got copies of the two. <laughs> so that's like another thing here is to show you how much work I did that nobody really ever saw. And I'm not doing that to like go like, oh, look at all my hard work. It's just like to kind of give you an idea. I think people want to like, I know a lot of people that are afraid to do their first big project because they want it to succeed. And it's like, I think you have to live by a different rule. Like, um, comedy writers, I've read books on comedy writing, and they have this rule, like, you write ten jokes hoping to get one good one, and that frees you up from having to come up with one awesome joke. You just keep writing jokes, and a good one's bound to show up. I think it's the same with projects. Like, you just keep making stuff, something good's bound to pop out of there. And a big lesson for me has been you can't pick your successes in life. You don't know which one's going to be your success. You just got to make stuff. So I made creep, you know, I made it with all my heart, and nobody read it. <clears throat> These were some other projects. This is a movie project this guy had me do a comic for. Um, I did an issue of this Puppet Terrors comic, which is awful. 
And then my first graphic novel, I wrote and drew it. took me two years. I thought this thing was, this is my project. It's going to, you know, I worked so hard. I wrote, I wrote it and every page, I don't have it with me here, but insanely detailed pages. Uh, I worked so hard on that book, believe me. And the thing that kept happening is I get like 20 pages in and go, oh my gosh, my drawing style's changed. I need to change the, I need to go back to page one and change the drawings again. And then I keep wanting to stop, but I'd like stop and I got to give up. And I start again. And even though maybe 50 people have read that book, it's the best thing I ever did. When I finally got that thing done, was when I finally started really creating. So I think that's, for me, if you have your Weeble, you have your project you think is the ultimate project you're going to get done, uh, figure out a limit that you think you can set. So maybe a 100-page graphic novel, or if that seems way too much, like maybe just do one 22-page or something. That, Set a goal and finish it so you can move on to the next project after it. It's amazing. You have no idea what that next project after this one is that you might have your heart set on. Or set it aside and do something else. A lot of people get hung up on that one big project. So this is just uh, showing, before I ever got published, my first comic published ever by any publisher, I had drawn 564 pages of comics. <clears throat> and most of the comics that anybody's ever, ever read. But I got picked up by SLG Comics. It was actually really uh, it was cool. After after the Weevil, I decided, you know what? I'm good at funny. I'm just really comfortable drawing funny comics. Uh, I I, th I think I kind of wanted to go in like the Jim Lee route, like draw really awesome and get hired to draw really awesome pictures of Batman. But I just started to realize it's really not me. Like I don't even hardly read Batman, and I just there's guys that are so much better at drawing. <coughs> I'm just going to do a comic. I'm very comfortable doing it. I'm going to spend, I spent about two and a half months on this one. Um, it's a full tray paperback, 112 pages. Um, but I did art that I could crank out. So I was able to do two to four pages a day of this book. And, uh, and just live in my comfort zone, be funny. And I took this into Emerald City Comic Con in Seattle and showed this to the president of Slate Labor Graphics, who happened to be sitting right there when I walked in. And he loved it. It was, a, it was the first time I ever walked into a convention, and uh, they didn't say, "Yeah, it's not really our style. It's not really looking for." It. Or, you know, we just have a lot of other stuff. Or, you know, all the excuses they give you. It was. I showed this to everybody, all the small publishers there, and they were all interested in getting to know me, and work with me, and giving me a business card. And it really made me realize, especially after starting to sit behind the table at other at publishers and see how the industry works. A lot of us have this idea that uh, we all, there's all these people with all these great ideas, but the publishers are gatekeepers and they're holding all this great stuff out. But really, like they're desperate for good material, and people bring stuff up all the time, and it's, it's so much bad stuff. And it's like when something good shows up, they're thrilled. Like everybody wants something good, and uh, so that's not been my experience anyway. I think that's your. Uh, if you think if you have that idea about the industry anyway. That's not been my experience. If you have something good, like people want it. They want to publish it. This was what I brought <laughs> to that convention that day. It was a mangled yellow M uh, folder, and I wrote that on the front. And I was actually, I was in a rock band at the time we had to play a show in Seattle that day. My friend got me for free, because I just, the, the last little bit of money I had, I spent on the printing out the comic, because I drew it all digitally. and. Uh, happened to get published by SLG. And that was really a big a big moment for me there because um, that was around when I stopped working my, my last uh, steady job. I worked at the sign shop. I got laid off. And while I was getting paid unemployment, I finished The Weevil. I animated a music video for my band, which was an insane amount of work, but it was pointless. And then I did this. I drew this entire book. So I worked day and night. The entire time I was on unemployment to like create a new body of work to start off, and it really did, it started me off on a new path. So that was it, I just this, I showed that to, and that, this like breaks all the rules of what they say to, to like show it at, at a review of a portfolio, you know, like they say like, well you have to have your address on every page, and it has to be a really nice presentation, but you know, I had my email address written on there. <laughs> but because the content was great, he didn't even care, like he just, you know, he was happy with what was in there. So I am doing a volume two, and this led to me doing my first TV pitch. So this is more stuff that you're not going to find on the internet generally. Um, 
I'm, you know, now I'm at conventions with Slay Liver Graphics, and a guy from Cartoon Network walks up to me and says, we read your stuff. You got any ideas for cartoons? And I said, I'll mix them up. So I made up my first idea. This is a, um, just to kind of show you for people that would like to do this kind of stuff. I, I was always curious. When I made my very first animation pitch, I had never seen one. And I still have you know, people talk about it, but they're like, I've never seen like an actual animation pitch, so I just kind of created my own basic, you know, so there's a synopsis and my like, main character and some sketches of the characters. These are my, some of my main characters in the show. So anyway, that was one of my first pitch ever. And they weren't interested, but it was my first pitch, so that was good. So I thought, oh, I bet I got to just start cranking out pitches, and at some point they'll get sick of me, and they'll, you know, they'll finally, oh, they'll, they'll, or they'll, uh, you know, I'll send enough to the, the point where they'll finally buy on one. So I was ready to start cranking out. So my first of my next big, I was going to like try to think of like ten different ideas was Snub Nose and Pug. And I created this with my little brother Isaiah, who's not nearly as much younger than me. He's six years younger than me. Um, and this was a TV show. That actually got optioned by Cartoon Network, and so just to kind of show you, this is the initial pitch that I that I showed them that it got optioned. And option sounds, it's exciting to get optioned, but it's also like they're getting you a little bit of money to do a bunch of development, and there's still a really good chance it's not going to be a show, which is exactly what happened. Here. Um, so I did my pitch or my synopsis of kind of the whole story of the show. Main characters, main bad guys. So then, after I had been working with them for about a year, uh, we developed the Bible more, and this was so. This is now what that turned into. So we have our cover cover page, we have our synopsis, characters, more characters. Now, yeah, what's the bad guys' outfits that he wears? You know, what are the weapons? How do they work? What are some episodes? So we have the origin story episode, I write the synopsis, some images from the episode, some other characters that show up in that episode, another episode here with characters from that episode, another one here with characters from that episode, and each one with an image with it. Two more episodes, more characters, and then uh, another episode with some more characters here. Then just more, more characters that could show up at any point in time, or they've already been mentioned. More characters, bad guys. More characters, more characters, and this is kind of like giving the feel for like the show. The show would be really action packed, so some of the action, and then just some like shots that I had to do for presentation. <coughs> See, like you're like well, probably most of you are going to do like a ton of work. I've never seen this before, but yeah, it's like a ton of work that you do that you do that I've never seen. <laughs> this is another pitch I did just to show you some other pitches. This is one of my favorites, but it uh, almost got picked up at Disney and it didn't. It's called Theory of the Marmoset. It's about an insane, like, imagine Haku from Samurai Jack in the body of the tiny marmoset, but he's being forced to be a good guy. Um, this one actually is optioned by Cartoon Network right now. Uh, this is called Chucks. Kind of a family comedy about wood chucks. <laughs> and they have a pet platypus. Uh, Weevil Forces, which is another pitch. There's a bunch of pages to this too, but I didn't want to put the whole pitch in the Another one. This is the first a couple of pages from Bear again. So, as I mentioned, uh, when I, when I got to the point with Bear Mageddon that I wanted to uh, do my next big project after Trumbull's Buzz, I'm going to publish this online, and, and it was scary to want to give it away for free. But uh, I think it's becoming less and less scary for people. I think you know, younger people now, it's just like obvious that you put it online. But for us, it, uh, I guess for people more around my age range, we were there for the transition from print to web, and it's just like scary to get your comics away from print online. But I've learned, obviously, through XCOP, <laughs> it makes sense to do it. So anyway, there's kind of the uh, the journey up to XCOP, and XCOP explodes. 
So obviously there's a huge element of luck with Axe Cop. I mean, I created, the funny thing about the first episode of Axe Cop, which I don't know why I don't have in the slideshow, is that some of the worst drawing I've ever done, I didn't think anyone was going to read it, except for my family and my little brother, stuff like that. So um, that became one of the most well-known pieces of art I've ever drawn. So I, if I could do it over again, I would have drawn better. <laughs> in fact, one of the tough things right now is Axe Cop action figures are being made. And they just sent me the first draft of the action figures, which I also wish I put in the slideshow. Uh, and they based the Axe Cop action figure on the very first drawing of Axe Cop I had ever done. He looks nothing like he looks now. He looks all noodly and weird and goofy. And, uh, and so that's yeah, kind of it's kind of awkward. Because <laughs> I'm like, I think I spent a ton of time on that. That doesn't look like Axe Cop now. <laughs> So this is kind of just like the journey of Axe Cop. Because Axe Cop came from, well, just to show you, like, these are actually scribbles that Malachi did. Or my little, uh, well, Malachi was three, and my little sisters were, they're around eight or nine. And Malachi has two sisters he lives with, and so they're all my half-siblings. They used to draw scribbles on a piece of paper, and then I turned them into drawings. So I, I turned these into all these, like, fish creatures, you know, keep the theme. This is like a way that when I would go visit my family, just to kind of have fun and still be drawing, but doing it with my little brothers and sisters. Here's some more of the squiggles. And I turn into these, these weird creatures. <coughs> and this is one of my favorite ones. This was, uh, Malachi did this scribble on this page. And I turned it into one of my favorite drawings ever. <laughs> Yeah, you can see Ethan and Malachi age three. So this is like three years or two years before Axe Cop happened. But it's just fun getting inspiration from <coughs> an unhinged little mind. Starting <laughs> here. This is the first time he and Malachi he made up a character, and as he described it, I drew it. So this is Snowman Snowball Shooter Grill. <laughs> and he would explain he has a gun in his back, he has a gun above his chest. Drills for legs. He's really into drill legs this time. <laughs> this is another one, Robot Snail Scientist. <laughs> just whatever he thinks is awesome, he just combines it. And he doesn't think about the logic of the love. So and he specifically said he had a giant knife on his gun. <laughs> yeah, robot body and the snail. Obviously very intelligent. Oh yeah, there's the first episode. So, uh, so yeah, that's the first episode of Axe Cop. Created on a whim, and now it's a TV show we're working on for Fox. Got toys coming out, and uh, it's been a crazy journey. We're working on our the fourth book's coming out. Basically, it's just the collection of President of the World, which is the new series with Dark Horse. Um, we did Bad Guy Earth in March. That was our first, uh, after Axe Cop took off, our, the thing that happened is uh, the webcomic Axe Cop exploded, and I'd only done like a few of these. And so Dark Horse Comics, actually like a bunch of comics publishers, publishers I had like baked, you know, I've shown stuff to for years, you know, all of a sudden like they're calling me. And uh, Dark Horse was, they made the best offer, but with their offer they said we'd really like to do a mini series, which would be three comic books. Like that's 22 pages per comic book. And like at this point we've done about three or four pages of this comic book. That's like 70. 75 pages of comic. Yeah. I'm like, how do I commit to that? I have no idea. And it just started to become apparent to Malachi. He's endless. Like, he just keeps going. And, uh, I said, all right. You guys pay so much in advance. I'll spend a month with Malachi, and we'll write an epic story. Well, instead of doing one page story, we'll do a 75 page story. And I literally spent an entire month with my, at the time, six year old brother. And we created Bad Guy Earth, which I, I, I kind of, it's like Narnia, but insane. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Narnia, but like C.S. Lewis fell down the stairs. <laughs> just kind of lost his mind. <laughs> when we started that story, we started off with a giant whiteboard and just started drawing a, a universe. We started writing. We just had planets randomly. The ghost world. Somewhere out in space, nobody knew this, but there's a giant red monster out there that wears sneakers. <laughs> and all these different things. This is actually in the bad guy's trade in the back. I redrew this. 
These are some of the notes I take while I'm working with Malachi. <coughs> Um, just as he's going, I just keep adding. So, one of the ways that we brainstorm is we go on different missions. So I'll write down missions. This mission we go to Viking time. So this one we fight Boss Kaka, who's a giant floating head with one eye and a crown. And Lavasaurus down there. He made he made it <coughs> there. Um, there's the magic bat. Uh, let's try and read it, but I can't. I write pretty sloppy. Brainstorming. <laughs> Here's where I'm down here at the bottom of the page is actually trying to explain to Malachi what time is. We're doing this story about time travel, and he just would think the past is a different planet or a place. I don't know. The past is before now. It's like it would be not. So I was trying to like, Here's now, and then he just like, that's that's the beginning. It's the future, and he just. He, didn't, like, he thought you could walk over to the beginning. <laughs> he, just, he just didn't get it. It was amazing. So this is a drawing he did of a, of a bad guy where all of the... Uh, a bunch of bad guy versions of the Axe characters get crammed into one head. And, like, they have a chainsaw over there. And that's it. I think that's two chainsaws, maybe. I'm not sure. Those are all hands coming out of the head. So I actually did a, a, my own rendition of this character in Bad Guy here. Here's just some other uh, just characters. What's funny about this is these are aliens that I drew. This is actually, I started drawing alien concepts, and Malachi goes, what are those? And I go, those are aliens. He goes, that's not how you draw aliens. <laughs> I go, okay, you describe how to draw an alien. Okay, draw a circle. And then just, and he's like, he art directed that alien head on the bottom character. And it said, do whatever you want for the body. <laughs> <laughs> he said that the head of that is the perfect alien head. So, you know, that's the authoritative Malachi alien. <laughs> this is some fun stuff that never made it in. Some of this is some of the so Ninja riding a robot bee. And then this guy, Mr. Chicken Chicken Slice, who I always, he's going to be in, at some point, but when he covers his eyes with his hands, a chicken shoots out of his brain. <laughs> So here's us playing with our, you know, we made a, this is the Uniplanet, and I got this planet of people with unicorn horns. They all got so smart that a unicorn horn shot out of their brain. <laughs> they're their planet, they actually have their planet too. That's a spaceship we made. So just some of our random creatures. We play, we do all sorts of stuff that never makes it in the comic. It's just like, I take my favorite stuff, what works for a story, and I put it all together and make it a story. But, uh, Anyway, so there's kind of like my rundown of the Axe Cop process and kind of uh, behind the scenes of creating, but um, I guess I, I, I actually prefer question and answer, so I don't know if uh, anybody has questions or... No, absolutely. Well, first of all, give Ethan a hand, guys. Do we have any questions for Ethan about uh, Axe Cop or... Chickens firing out of people's brains. <laughs> hey, um, I was just wondering how the process has changed as he's gotten a bit older, so you no longer have to explain time, and <laughs> whether sort of being more aware about the world around him changes how the story comes out. You get a video game for <laughs> creating an act <act-top> story. <laughs> 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 so. I started off with like, you know, just to give us some incentive, I was like, hey, for each X Cop story, finish, I'll need video games. And also, like, you know, we put a part of the money away for each of our, all the X Cop stuff for him. But something more tangible for him is an actual video game. And at first, it didn't drive him very much. But now that he's getting older, he'll call me out of the blue and go, I have a new story. Or, no, no, don't even say that. Say, I know I have a new game I want to get. Like, all right, so let's start writing. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it doesn't affect, like, the thing is, he knows that it has to be stuff I can use, because ultimately it's my job to make Axe Cop entertaining and sellable and fun, and it has to be... <coughs> so, he has to give me plenty of material to work with. And, uh, but he's gotten the hang of story more, he's gotten the hang of plot twists more. Uh, it is going to be fascinating to see how he incorporates that into his writing, if he keeps writing it because he gets older, because he has... Um, I don't know. I still, I still don't, I'm still blown away. It's like he, he finds tropes that like no, there's no way he knew about them. Like we're working on this Axe Cop Gets Married story, and he's creating this. This is kind of a spoiler if you guys are reading right now, but he 
creates a character that I got stopped looking for a wife and he first finds a woman who's an axe girl. Who's basically him, but in girl form. <laughs> and he loves her at first, but then he can't stand her because she's the exact same as him and he doesn't, he doesn't like her like that. And he wants someone who's his friend. <laughs> and he has a different character set that's his friend. So it's like so funny that he, I don't know where, how he thought of that, but you know, things like that. And I think that a lot of, uh, a lot of tropes and things like those come out. More questions? Go oh, over here. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering when you work with the uh, rubber, when it's worked with like, the patient side of it, is it, do you have quite long gears or is it sort of short bursts? Because I'll try and use one of the sister's imagination, but she gets about two sentences in and just runs off. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that is very hard, especially the bad guy here. Yeah, that was a full month I was trying to keep them on the same story. And that was a freaking challenge. And there's ways that we did it. Um, uh, part of it was, I mean, really, like, if I spend a whole month working with Malachi, we really only get a good maybe hour of writing each day where the material is useful. Um, the rest of the time is we just have to play and have fun and do other stuff that has nothing to do with Axe Cop. Like, it doesn't work. Like, I can't just sit there. Like, it's work time. <laughs> uh, it has to be fun. And it has to be created in a fun moment for it to be good. And so we have to work our way up to that fun. And uh, the moment he feels like I'm just trying to squeeze the story out of him, like, it's over. It just doesn't work. So, um, yeah, keeping him on the same topic. For one thing, I don't think Axe Cop would have been a, definitely wouldn't have been a recurring character. I created the comic on him, but and we just kept asking, well then what happens with X Cop? And it just became a thing. Like, for him it wasn't even a character when he first made it, it was just a job that he thought I, I think he might have even thought it really existed. And uh, <laughs> one thing we would do on a, when we were creating bad guy earth, the problem I ran into is for X Cop had never had a real overarching bad guy before that. And bad guy earth, we needed a bad guy for him to be battling and to be a to be the big conflict throughout the whole three issues. And the only bad guys we really had at that point were really easy to kill. Like King Evil Fouts is on, you just throw a <laughs> unicorn horn into him and he explodes into a bunch of fat. And telescope gun cop, you just bomb him and he dies. And, uh, so I realized when I first said, okay now okay, we need a good bad guy for this, and he goes, punch yourself in the face, man. <laughs> <laughs> Spikes right out of his hand when he punches himself in the face. And I go, that would kill him. He goes, yeah, but it kills the guy who's trying to hold him from behind. <laughs> but then he dies, so it's like a bee sting or something. It's like, apparently like a guy jumps on, punches himself in the face man from behind, and grabs him like this, and he goes, also kills him. So he just kept making up these characters called it. Explode Man or something like that. These were guys that were just so easy to kill. And so finally I gave up and the next day, I said, All right, Malachi, today is bad guy day. He goes, what's that mean? I go, today we're bad guys. And uh, so it's make up some bad guy characters that we are and we're fighting Axe Cop today. So then suddenly the psychic brother's getting invented. So like, it's always, everything always comes in two brothers because it's always me and him playing. And, uh, all of a sudden, they did the most. I didn't know how we were going to feed them because, like, they're stealing all the unicorn horns and they're like turning it, Vikings and pirates and dinosaurs and everybody on Earth into bad guys. They're going to turn the entire Earth into bad guys. And suddenly, we had like the most four, like, horrendous bad guys in the Axe Cop universe because we spent a day playing bad guys. So then we alternate good guy days and bad guy days. Um, we would also do side stories. So we, uh, some of the Axe Cop presents comics on our has a scene where we did like. Stuff that's not Axe Cop at all, Jack and John, zombie vampire, or zombie, yeah, zombie vampire hunters. Um, the last time I went there for a month, there was no way to stay on the story, so we kept uh, swapping between stories. And um, the most recent <coughs> video is called President of the World. You'll notice there's a few different stories kind of weaving together in that one. It's because there were different stories he was telling, and I put them together. There's a story about the giant gorilla, there's a story about the man made of goo, there's a story about Axe Cop being president of the world, uh, that whole conflict. So I just like, I realize that the stories kind of could connect in some way. I'll ask them questions, they go, well, how does this connect? And then all of a sudden they'll create a connection. And so a lot of, a lot of it's Q&A. 
Like you have to get enough material to have stuff to go off of, and then you start asking him tons of questions, and he fills in the rest. So that's usually what makes it funny. It's just like him adding, having to fill in his own plot holes. It's always so funny. Let's <laughs> be question over there. to go trick-or-treating with me. Anyone else want to go trick-or-treat? No. They never want to come, so I always go alone. <laughs> candies. Trick or treat. I have a large candy bucket with a picture on it of me boxing with my axe. It glows in the dark. It can light up the whole world. Sometimes a place will be locked. So I get in with my axe and take some candy. On Halloween, all the cops are asleep and you can take any candy you want. Last year when I got home, I counted the candy. 1,051 candies for us all! <laughs> but then I had to check them for poison. I used poison detecting goggles in my axe. I threw the poison ones in the poison trash. 11 candies for us all! Yes! Yeah. <laughs> Happy Halloween. <laughs> This was also the most recent. Ask X Cup. Hey, dear X Cup, would you ever consider running for president? And if so, what would your platform be? Sincerely, it's me, Teach. Yeah. Have you ever had? <laughs> yes, I'd be a great president. First off, I would abolish the word please. Anyone who says the word please will go to jail for 100 weeks. What? Come, finally. As president, I would also be magic. <laughs> all my money to the poor. There you go. I would make a bomb that only kills bad people. <laughs> But some of the bad guys would have survived because they escaped to the bad guy planet the day I became president. Which is why, two days before I was elected, I went to bad guy planet and filled it with bombs. <laughs> And I approve this message. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, do you see Axcop becoming a long term project in terms of when your brother grows up? Will the Axe stop character become Brighton and Steve Horn? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, yeah, that's the question I get the most. Uh, is, you know, obviously, Axe stop based on Malachi's age. Um, and I, I don't know. I don't, I'm don't. i open to Axe stop being either way. I mean, either it's just like a, a snapshot of his childhood, 
and then we just look back on it, it's funny. Or I used to think that's what it was going to be actually, and then now as I've seen him grow up, he loves Axe Cop and he loves making it. And I think I think as long as a, a project is made with passion behind it, it's going to be good and fun. And as long as it's fun for me and him to make and fun for readers to read, like I say, we can go because it could be fascinating to see Axe Cop grow up, and see him, you know. Hormones start kicking in and all kind of stuff, and uh, it can be fascinating. So I'm open, to that. and also him having to deal with the world he set up as a kid, and now stuck in the rules of that world or whatever. If like if blood gets on you and you turn into that thing or whatever, it's, we'll probably get an age where he wants to draw blood baths and he has to think of like, well, oh, crap. <laughs> we have this rule in the Axe Cop universe where blood, blood from like, uh, or if you eat an avocado, you turn into an avocado man or whatever. So, I don't know. We'll see. Um, but yeah, so I think I think there's also a chance that he likes sharing Axe Cop. Like he doesn't feel like he has to be the one writer. So I think I can even see him writing Axe Cop with another little kid younger than him. Because one thing for him is uh, I'm actually engaged right now, and I have um, two kids that are my stepkids, and my stepson is three. And the way Malachi interacts with him is so awesome. Like so Malachi's always had brothers that are way older than him. You know, me and my two brothers are. You know, we all could be his dad if we, you know, age-wise, anyway. So <clears throat> he uh, he likes being a, a big brother, and I think I could see him possibly like doing a separate storyline where, like, you know, maybe a new kid comes in and does their own story. Who knows? I'm kind of open to who, who knows. Like X Cop, it's Malachi, and I want to keep an X Cop story that is Malachi, and it's possible to branch out and try to have some other kids write their own X Cop stories, or um, even try to do one. I think it's been fun uh, working on the TV show. Really, what we have to do is write episodes based on X Cop material that we can't just write straight from the comic. It doesn't work to fit into an 11 minute time slot. So it's still as fun to like, be forced into the universe and to write a story within the universe. I think there's still a ton of possibilities, and I'm just kind of I'm kind of going along. And once, uh, hopefully, I have enough like self awareness that once it's dead, like I, I know it's dead, and I don't keep like me and trying to make it work. Any question? Uh, how do you feel that um, uh, you creating Ascom with him and you know continuing on has affected your relationship with him and also what you say in your personal opinion is like the whack is seeing his character and things come up with mm. <coughs> um, a moment that I really like bad guy or which I wish I had. I can't think of where it would be. But, uh, my favorite moment is in Bad Guy there's a scene where there's a bad guy version of Axe Cop's team. So there's Chainsaw Cop versus Axe Cop. Uh, there's Blue Cop is now turned into Eagle Zombie Bear or Bear Present no, it's Bear Cop. He got bear blood on him Bear Cop now, so there's like Eagle Grizzly Bear. There's all these bad guy versions of fighting the good guy versions. And the bad guys suddenly have this wild card they pull and they all combine into one giant horrifying creature where it's like chainsaw cop and bear and like robot snow dinosaur and like all these things turn into this thing that looks like something out of the book of Revelation and it kills X Cop's team. But luckily Ralph Prickles, X Cop's dog, uh, he was only frozen, so he thought out and he licked up everybody's blood and used it to heal them. Like apparently your blood can heal you. And so like, they all came back and they said, we need to combine. So they went to a machine that combined them. And Axe Cop's whole team combined into one giant atrocious beast that's like Axe Cop and Uniman and Sakarang and like Wexter, like T-Rex. And then the next page you just see these two hideous creatures fighting. And it's just the most bizarre thing I've ever drawn. It's my favorite. Um, there's also a tie. <laughs> I can look up. Uh, Malachi told me he wanted to create a bad guy. He wanted to create the ultimate bad guy. His name is Everyman. He's half man, half everything. So I said, so it could be any kind of superhero, good guy, bad guy, anything from fantasy, and what, all every weapon. So it's just like a giant tornado made of everything. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, you got an elephant, killer whale, a lion, there's a lobster. Raptor up there, just some guy with a chainsaw. 
there's a unicorn, the walrus, the pirate bomb, I think. So yeah, that was one of the more insane projects. There's a bear holding a handful of bombs. <laughs> <laughs> Caper. A lot of animals I like in there. Um, what was the other part of your question? Uh, how's it affected your 